Okay, looks like we're ready to go. All right, today we're going back and picking up the momentum balance derivation that we interrupted last time. So let me just remind you where we are, starting with these slides. We already derived the mass balance, so we're going to the momentum balance. And the mass balance didn't have a term like this. It had a rate of increase of mass, a rate of increase of mass term, which is like this rate of increase in momentum term, and it had a net fu flux of mass term, which is like this flux term, and this term, the sum of the forces, this is the F equals MA part. So in this case, uh, this is like summation, summation forces equals mass times acceleration. So that term is from Newton's second law. Uh, the mass, in fact, these are all forces. This is the mass times acceleration is also a force. Um, so the difference is that this is Newton's law written uh, for the case where you have, where you're holding on to a control volume. So this is the flux into a volume, into a volume, force on a volume. Whereas Newton's law, this guy, is actually written on a body. So we talk about the forces on a body, but we are always staying with the body, the, the ball. As the ball moves through space, we're always following the ball. What's the velocity of the ball as it moves through space? We've changed our perspective to um, starting out with this volume, okay, which is fixed in space. We're letting mass flow through it. And that's why F equals MA looks a little bit different, is because mass is flowing through a fixed volume instead of the mass, meaning the ball or the block sliding down a hill or any of the other physics applications of F equals MA or mechanics applications. You have a beam and this mass and it moves up or down. It, you're always talking about the mass itself and how it's moving. We're talking about a volume and the mass is moving through it. So the correct formulation of F equals MA, when you have a fixed mass, I mean, excuse me, a fixed volume with mass moving through it, has this net flux of momentum term. Okay? So this is the MA part. The rate of increase of momentum is like the rate of change of momentum. F equals MA, rate of change of momentum equals sum of the forces. But there's this extra term, which is the net flux of momentum in due to momentum flowing in and out. So, that's kind of the difference between physics and uh, fluid mechanics, is we've changed our perspective from body-centric to control volume-centric point, point of view. Now, we've been working on this. Uh, we picked the volume. We enclosed it with a surface S. And we identified little pieces of volume and little pieces of area, OK? Little pieces of volume like, like a, maybe a square part. Just a little square part here. We can take a little piece of volume. It's not going to cooperate, so I won't do it. A little piece of volume uh, and write the mass, const the, excuse me, the momentum that uh, is associated with that little piece of volume, and that was this, this expression. So we said for a little piece of volume, I don't know why I'm having trouble here today. For this little piece of volume, dV, this is the momentum associated with it. This is mass per volume times velocity. So mass times velocity is momentum. Mass per volume times velocity is momentum per volume. Momentum per volume times volume is momentum. So then integrals, think of integrals as add them all up. So add up all the little pieces of dV, and you get the total momentum. So everything in these parentheses is the total momentum. And then the rate of change of total momentum is what we were looking for. Leibniz rule allows us to take a derivative outside an integral and bring it inside. And when the volume is a constant, it comes inside just as a partial derivative. So that gave us our final result. The second term, the net flux into momentum term, 
we wrote as volumetric flow rate, this last two terms here was volumetric flow rate of plus this n dot v part of momentum. So rho v is momentum. So n dot v ds was the volumetric flow rate, n dot v ds. And then rho v was the momentum. So that became the net momentum out because this is the outwardly pointing unit normal. And so we made it, we added it up for over the, every piece of surface through which it could pass. So again, an integral is adding it up, in this case, over the various surface integrals, surface pieces. And we got the total momentum out, and we turned it into total momentum in uh, by putting the minus sign. Now this was written, naturally, it was written over surface because it's a flux through a surface. So it made sense in this case to write it as something that included a surface. But we could turn it into something that includes a volume using the Gauss divergence theorem. So the Gauss divergence theorem we had from before. Looks like I didn't bring it. Gauss divergence theorem relates integrals over surfaces to integrals over volume. And the thing that changes is instead of this flux-like construction with n dot something over the surface, it becomes the gradient dot something over the surface. So this is called the divergence. This is the divergence of this property, which is the property we were looking at the flux of. And spontaneously we get this um, del dot term here because of the Gauss divergence theorem. And so we've turned a surface integral into a volume integral with the same meaning. And uh, it's going to allow us to combine these two terms together under the same integral. And then the last easy one that we did was gravity. So this, again, I'm going to scroll back a little bit. That we're now working on the sum of the forces term. And one of the kinds of forces is gravity force, F equals ma. So mass per volume times acceleration. Mass times volume is ma mass per volume times volume is mass. Mass times acceleration is force. Add up all the forces that, uh, that happen on these little volumes to get the big volume total force, and we get the force due to gravity. So last time I summarized this just before we took off and actually did an example. And I summarized how far we had gotten, which was we have done the net convective, the rate of increase term equals the net convective term in and the gravity force. So we have, we have done this term, we've done this term, and we've done this term. And I said we would do this last term, the molecular forces, and defer till Monday, which is today. So here we are at the stuff we deferred till today. And I told you that this was going to lead to the stress tensor. So that's where we're off to. Now, this stress tensor part is a little bit conceptually abstract, perhaps. But it's really the whole reason uh, we have a field of rheology, uh, is that we need to somehow quantify the way stress is generated inside uh, a moving fluid. So what we've done so far is look at all of the way momentum is transferred into some crazy volume. And we've taken into account body forces, forces that, take, that are written as force at a distance. That's what gravity is. It's force at a distance. Because we can just write an arbitrary small piece of volume. This is what I was trying to draw before. This little piece of volume has forces added on, acting on it. I can add that up and fill up my volume, and I get that force. But there are also forces in the fluid that count as contact forces on this outer surface, or on a piece of surface here, or on a piece of surface here. So there are all kinds of forces that are acting by virtue of, let's say it's a polymer, if you have polymers inside a flowing fluid. If the polymer itself crosses the boundary, then there's some effect force because, let's say, this 
particular molecule happens to be in motion in this direction, okay, then there's some kind of surface force that's associated with that motion. Or if it's not a polymer, if it's a small molecule, but, but it's filled up with these little red dots, and they're in motion, these guys may be going this way, and uh, these guys are going this way at, at a slower speed. So there's a frictional force along this surface. So maybe there's a, a friction between particles. Maybe there's an elasticity. So maybe, again, we have a polymer that spans the boundary, and this one is feeling stretched. And so there's kind of an elastic force maybe felt at the boundary. So there's all kinds of various forces that act on the surface of our arbitrary volume. And that's extremely complex. So our problem is that we have to first say we're talking about this kind, this granular type system, or we're talking about polymers, or we're talking about toluene, or we're talking about peanut butter. We have to specify the type of material we're dealing with before we can say what are these surface forces. So that's a difficulty. And that's why uh, in rheology, in fact, when you get down to having to specify these forces, you do have to say, I'm talking about uh, a thermoplastic. I'm talking about a filled polymer system before you can specify what is the stress law. But we wouldn't want to have to do that before we even got started. So our idea is to generate a general expression. Right? We're trying to answer this question. How can we write these forces, these surface forces, in general, and leave the details to la till later. Okay, how can we write something times my surface, integrated, added up over that surface, equals surface force on my volume V. That's what I'm looking for. What exactly do I write here? The thing is, is that right from the start, it's not exactly clear what I should write there. It's not that clear. And that's why we had to do all this math background so far, because it's going to need, it's going to turn out to be a tensor. We're going to need a, a linear vector function that's going to give us the surface. Because in order to answer this question, I've got a surface ds, so I've chosen the surface. I can specify its orientation the way I've been specifying surface orientations up till now with an outwardly pointing unit normal. But the force on this surface is just some vector f. And if I pick a neighboring element, I have no assurance that that f is in the same direction. I don't know that f is in the same direction as n. n is now a new direction, so this is the first one. This is now my second uh, chosen surface element. And for all I know, f is in a completely different direction and with a different magnitude and on and on and on as I work my way around, around the surface. So it's, it's not clear how to put in. I can't just do like I did with, say, gravity, where gravity is the same in every position. Gravity times volume, add them up, it works. Okay? Flux through the surface worked because I could say, well, the velocity is whatever it is, the n is whatever it is, n dot v is the flux, n dot v times the surface area is the volumetric flow rate, 
biometric fluoride, et cetera. It all worked out very nicely. We could just logically proceed to our term. This F is a different uh, magnitude, a different direction at every location. So that's what I'm saying here. Molecular forces, this is the tough term. We're looking for this force F, the stress at some location on a chosen surface. If we knew, if we knew this stress, then stress times area would give force and we'd have our answer. But it has to work for an arbitrary location in the flow because we've been choosing an arbitrary volume in the flow and within that arbitrary volume there's all kinds of different locations. So here's sort of a neater version of what I'm saying. On any chosen surface, if I have say toluene pinging around uh, with Brownian motion, these are maybe small molecules, that they have some momentum that they're transferring across my given surface and that transfer of momentum looks like a surface force. Or I can have polymer squiggles and their elasticity or their motion looks like a surface force. Or I can have a very organized crystal in a shear, which is what I've drawn here. These, this layer is going one way, this layer is going the other. And I, ha I, have, I have to be able to draw an arbitrary surface, any arbitrary surface, and write what the force is. So we're going to concentrate on expressing this vector mathematically. We're going to leave the task of exactly figuring out uh, what the details are compared to molecules uh, a little bit later when we talk about specific systems. So in our problem, we know that if we can write an arbitrary surface S, which has a unit normal N, we can say in general it has some force F which is not necessarily collinear with N. So this F has components parallel to the surface and perpendicular to the surface. If I can write it, if I can write an expression for F, I can go back over here and say this is the force on the surface the force on the surface times the, so force per area times area would give me the force. If I added it all up, I would get molecular force on the surface. This big surface S. So I'm looking for force per area in a flowing liquid. I'm going to start with a definition of a, a quantity. I'm going to pick a point in space, arbitrarily, and I'm going to name the forces on specific surfaces. So I'm going to choose a coordinate system. A Cartesian coordinate system. And I'm going to then define if I pick the surface that's perpendicular to E1 then I'm going to call the force on that surface A just for now. This is the force on a surface of unit normal E1 at P. Now this is a vector and this is a chosen coordinate system and we can write any vector in a chosen coordinate system the usual way. We can write A equals AIEI which is A1 E1 plus A2 E2 plus A3 E3. Now we can also look at what this is saying in words. This is our vector A. 
It's the force on a surface of unit normal n. So I've chosen one particular surface. It's not my arbitrary surface ds anymore. It's only good for a very specific choice. The, I've, once I've chosen the coordinate system, it's only true for the one where the unit normal is in the one direction. But this coefficient we can also put into words. This is the force in the one direction on a surface of unit normal E1. So A1 is the force in the one direction. And A2 is the force in the, in the two direction. And A3 is the force in the three direction on a surface whose unit normal is E1. It's complicated. Force in the two direction on a surface whose unit normal is E1. Force in the three direction on a surface whose unit normal is E1. So because of all this language, we're going to try to get organized and define something a little bit systematic. Since we have force on a one surface in the one direction, let's to find something organized. Let's say pi 1 1 is the stress on a one surface in the one direction. So that's A1. Let's call stress on a one surface in the two direction a12. So that's just A2. And likewise, stress on a one surface in the three direction is A3. So going back to here, we can write this general vector A in terms of these pi's as A equals A1 E1 plus A2 E2 plus A3 E3 using the new pi nomenclature. Now, I haven't done anything. I've just been defining things, but it's getting kind of organized now. So if I go back to my point P and say, OK, well now, instead of considering a surface of unit normal E1, I'm going to consider a surface of unit normal E2. And the force on that surface is going to be some other vector, which we'll call B. So B is the force on a two surface. And we could write it as B1E1 one one plus B2E2 two two plus B3E3. Force on a two surface. So we could write it as the force on a two surface in the one direction force on a two surface in the two direction, force on a two surface in the three direction. Now I'm, I no, just notice I'm making a mistake here. I have to multiply, to get force I have to multiply by ds because these are stresses. This is stress equals force per area. So we multiply by area and now it's correct for force. So I'll go back here as well and correct. This is for stress on a one surface in the one direction. So if I multiply the whole thing by ds, it's correct now, force. I wrote it correctly here, stress. Stress on a one surface. Stress is force per unit area.
Pi? Yes, it is. Uppercase pi. What other meaning do you use it for? Like pi r squared pi? No, like the multiplication of a series of numbers. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah. What yes. we'll see actually is that uh, this capital pi is, is going to turn out to be the total stress tensor. And we're going to split it into two pieces and use one of the sub pieces far more often, which is the extra stress tensor tau. So you won't have to worry about the nomenclature for too much longer. OK, so going to my prepared slides, what have we done? What we've been saying is we're looking at an arbitrary surface. That's our goal. So in order to write some expression related to the arbitrary surface, we chose some point P in space. And we said that there's some surface, this one, in 3D now, who has a unit normal E1. That's this surface. It has, a, it has a vector force on it, A. And the surface with unit normal E2, which is this one in here, has a force B on it. And this, for, this surface, which we haven't done yet, but by analogy, that has a unit normal E3 has a vector C on it. So these are, uh, in my notes, looks like I have did it a little bit differently than in uh, class just today. I wrote these as stresses rather than forces. So this is stress on a one surface, stress on a two surface, stress on a three. And as I did just now, we can write it in the coordinate system as AIEI. -E or with these newly defined quantities, pi 1, 1, E1, pi 1, 2, E2, pi 1, 3, E3. All three together is a bit of an alphabet soup, but there's a logic to it. There's an organization to it. So A, B, and C are the forces at a point, the stresses at a point, on a one surface, a two surface, and a three. So when it's on a one surface, the first index is one. When it's on the two surface, the first index is two. When it's on a three surface, the first index is three. And the fact that there's a one component, two component, three component is a reflection of the fact that these vectors, these vector stresses, are not in the one direction. They have their own, excuse me, this one, they have their own direction. So they are a vector itself that have a component in the 1, 2, and 3 direction. Now, this has just been nomenclature. All right? So now we have this quantity pi, the stress on a p surface in the k direction. And this just becomes a way to keep track of the various stresses. What we're really interested in is the force on an arbitrary surface. So let's draw that. We choose a point P. We put an arbitrary surface through it that has a unit normal N, and it has some force F on that surface. This, we can follow the same procedure and say, well, F can be written as F1, E1, F2, E2, F3, E3. This quantity is the force on a N surface in the one direction. F1. F2, force on an end surface in the 2 direction. And F3, force on an end surface in the 3 direction.
So this doesn't immediately map to any of our pi's because our pi's are force on a one surface in the one direction, force on the two surface in the et cetera, et cetera, I surface in the k direction. But there's something going on here that's reminiscent. Pi pk force on a something surface in the one direction. If I go back and look at my pi's in the one direction only relates to three of the pi's. There are nine of these pi's because k goes from one to three, p goes to one to three, but there's only three that are in the one direction, right? On a p surface in the k direction. So k has to be one in order for it to be in the one direction. Can't use the k equal two ones, can't use the k equal three. So pi one one is somehow related pi 2 1 is the force on a 2 surface in the one direction and the force on a 3 surface in the one direction. These three stress components have something to do with F1, the force on an N surface in the one direction. These have nothing to do with anything in the 2 direction, anything in the 3. So F1 is composed of some mixture of a force on a one surface in the one direction, a force on a two surface in the one direction, and a force on a three surface in the one direction. Some combination, but what combination would that be? Okay, but these are clearly the three that matter. The other six don't matter at all. So let's see if we can figure that out. We have an arbitrary surface of arbitrary shape uh, ds. It goes through point P. It has some force vector on it F. There's some coordinate system 1, 2, 3. The, let's, let's consider pi 1, 1. Uh, stress on a one surface in the one direction. Okay, we're, we're just trying to deal with the component of F in the one direction. So that's, this is the one direction. So F1 is the projection of F in the one direction. This component of F in the one direction is composed of pi 1, 1, the force on a one surface in the one direction, times an area uh, that is the projection of S in the one direction. Okay. Pi 1, 1 is the stress on a one surface in the one direction. The one surface, if I project this crazy DS in the one direction, so somehow project it into this plane, the 2, 3 plane, all right, that projection, then this stress, this is force per area, times the appropriate area gives the uh, force that is the contribution that's related to pi 1, 1. The force in the one direction on a two direction would be if we could somehow project this guy in the two direction, there's some projection, put that area in, and if I could project it in the three direction, which if I did would just make a mess at this point, I'd get the appropriate area that gives the contribution to just F1, because these are all in the one direction, that's due to the stress written in this coordinate system, but now related to our very specific surface F, uh, DS. That's the difficult concept right there. So that's the one that um, I'm trying to get across from you. Let's 
Let's summarize it on my neat slides, and maybe the second time through it'll make more sense. We have an arbitrary surface DS oriented arbitrarily in space. It has an unknown uh, force per unit area on it. F is the force on DS in the one direction, F1. F2 is the force on DS in the two direction. F3 is the force on DS in the three direction. As I said, there are three stress components that deal with forces in the one direction. The second subscript is one. I can find the contribution of this pi 1, 1 to F1, just F1 now, by multiplying this force per area times the area, which is the projection of our little surface, which is called dA here, but is really ds. There's a typo there. Okay, the projection of this surface in the one direction gives the correct portion of the F1 component here that is due to pi 1, 1. The projection of a surface onto an area is a little mathematical exercise that's in the back of the book. It's equal to the unit normal of that surface area dotted with the vector direction you're interested in times the area. So that's just geometry. I'm not going to show you that. But we can put it all together. This is force per area times the area that is the proper weighting area. And we get this term for one of the three contributions to F1. We're going to add them all up to get just the force in the one direction. These are the components that have something to do with one direction. There's a one, there's a one, there's a one. And how to weight them, how much each of them weights on uh, the F1 component of F, is the projection of the surface in their three directions. Force on a one surface in the one direction, so it's the one component in some sense of the surface, the one projection of the surface. Stress on a two surface in the one direction times the projection in the two direction. Stress on a three surface in the one direction, projection in the three direction. Add them up. Add them up and you get the force in the one direction. So I'm just going to, on the next slide, I'm going to show these three terms added together to give just F1. Here's, here's an explanation graphically of those projections with the best that I'm able to do um, uh, artistically. Here's an arbitrary surface DS. And if I shine a light in the one direction, it casts a shadow that looks like this. If I shine a light, in the negative 2 direction, it casts a shadow like this in the 1, 3 plane. If I shine a light in the x minus x3 direction, it casts a shadow like this. That's what those projections are. So as this slide shows, but as I'll repeat here, we have the force in the one direction on ds is equal to pi 1 1 times the projection of the area in the one direction which is n dot e1 ds plus the stress on a two surface in the one direction times the projection in the two direction ds plus the stress on a three surface in the one direction times the projection of the surface in the three direction, which is n dot e3 ds. And this is all we need to do. The rest is Einstein notation, distributive law, associative law, commutative law, etc. We're just going to manipulate this thing. And what we're going to find is that we've already deduced that stress must be a tensor. By just writing this equation, we've already deduced that stress is going to be a tensor. So let's do that. 
Okay, let's factor out the ds. And each term, th these are just scalars. They go anywhere. This is n dot something, n dot something. We can factor out the n dot as well. n dot something ds. So it's pi 1, 1, e1, plus pi 2, 1, e2, plus pi 3, 1, e3. Just double check, n dot e1, pi 1, 1, ds, n dot e2, pi 2, 1, ds, n dot e3, pi 3, 1, ds. All I did was the distributive law uh, backwards, which is factoring. This is just F1. I can write a similar one for F2 using all the same logic. Now, you can maybe imagine that it's going to look very similar, right? Can you tell how it will look different if I'm talking about the two component instead of the one component? Just the uh, second subscript on the pi. Right. The second subscript on the pi will all be 2. Right? Because these are force on a one surface in the one direction, two surface, one direction, three surface, one. So this is the component in the two direction. Still going to be all that same business about projection. All that's going to be true. The only difference is we're going to talk about the two directions. So n dot pi 1, 2 e1 plus pi 2, 2 e2 plus pi 3, 2, e3, ds. And f3, same deal, with the second subscript instead of 2 is now 3. Pi 1, 3, e1, plus pi 2, 3, e2, plus pi 3, 3, e3, ds. So now we just have to put F together, and we've got F1, F2, and F3, so we just put them together using the general expression for a vector. F is FPEP, which is F1, E1, plus F2, E2, plus F3, E3. So we've got a little bit of algebraic nightmare here, okay? But we've got nine terms, okay? Let's start it and then give up at some point because nobody likes to write this kind of stuff. F1 is right here. So it's n dot pi 1, 1, E1 plus pi 2, 1, e2 plus pi 3 1 e3 ds e1 plus f2 n dot all that business ds e2 plus n dot all that long business from up here ds E3. If we did all that algebra, you'd just fall asleep, so I'll just indicate it there. And let's see what we just did. Let's in particular look here. N dot E1 next to E1. There's the tensor. When I distribute this, with this, I'm going to get a bunch of vector dyads. F equals, this is just a vector, F, okay? But it's n dot something, big long something, ds. A big long something, ds. Pi 1, 1, e1, e1. Pi 1, 1, e1, e1, ds, n dot on the outside. Pi 2, 1, E2, E1, DS on the outside. 
pi 3 1 e 3 e 1 there's the ds it's here there's the n dot plus this second one uh, pi 1 2 e 1 e 2 Okay, this has an E2 in the second position because there's going to be E2s. I don't have these written, but you've got them from the previous slide. Plus pi 2, 2, E2, E2. Plus pi 3, 2, E3, E2. See, we have all these same E1, E1, E1. That's this guy. E2, 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 that's this guy. Likewise, we'll have E3 in the third position in this uh, third grouping here. Pi 1, 3, E1, E3, plus pi 2, 3, E2, E3, plus pi 3, 3, E3, E3. And once again, in here, they're all E3s. That's the E3 right there. And inside here from the previous slide is this pi 1, 3, E1 plus pi 2, 3, E2 plus pi 3, 3, E3. And so look what happened. It turned into the sum of nine dyads. It turned into the general expression for a tensor. So we never said, oh, stress must be a tensor. You have to believe me. Uh, it's logical, someday you'll understand it. Well, that day is today, okay? Stress is a tensor just because of, of the logic we've used. Let's go back and see if, if we can recognize it. We started with an arbitrary surface, ds. We said it had an unit normal, it had some force. We said that that force is a general vector, which we can write in an arbitrary coordinate system. Everything is completely straightforward. We focused on the force in the one direction and said that it had contributions from three stress components. Pi 1 1, Pi 2 1, Pi 3 1. The stress is in the one direction. The second component was in the one direction. And that the, those three contributions broke out based on the projections of our arbitrary area in the three directions, one, two, three. One, two, three are the first subscripts. When we wrote that F and put it back into this F1, E1, F2, E2, F, everything we just wrote just goes here and has an E1 in the second position. That's what happened here. Everything we just wrote goes back in with the E1 in the second position. And a similar expression goes in with an E2 in the second position for the F2. And a whole big mess here goes in for F3. And then just algebraically, when we distribute everything out, we see that we've now got a pi n dot a tensor pi, where that tensor is written in the general tensor form um, n dot n, let's say, m e m dot pi i p e i e p. These 27 terms, excuse me, these nine terms are these nine terms. I goes from 1 to 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. That's I going from 1 to 3. P goes from 1 to 3. 1, 2, 3, P's going from 1 to 3. So stress is completely consistent with everything we've defined as a tensor. And on top of that, not just that stress is a tensor, but the force on an arbitrary surface of unit normal n is n dot that tensor. That's what we were looking for. Back here, I, I dropped the ds again. We pick a surface ds. We know what its unit normal is. 
If I want to know what the force is, I just need to know the stress tensor at that point. I just need to know the stress tensor at that point. N dot pi times the uh, surface area S is F. That's exactly the expression we needed at the very beginning when we said we needed something to write to be able to finish our momentum balance. Okay. Here was our momentum balance thus far. Rate of increase of momentum, convection in gravity, molecular forces. Now we can write this molecular force term by saying, I have my crazy volume V. I choose a piece of surface DS. It has an outwardly pointing unit normal N. The molecular forces on the surface S, the total surface S, is equal to the force per area, well, or we've actually already got it as force, so let's say the force, added up force on DS, added up over all the DSs to give S, and so that must be N dot pi DS, that's the force on DS, added up over the entire surface. We can now use uh, the divergence theorem on that and turn it into a volume integral. Integral over the volume, n dot something ds becomes grad dot something ds. dv, excuse me, dv. And there's only one subtlety left, uh, which is the sign of the stress tensor, which I'll talk about uh, next time because I'm already two and a half minutes over. Okay? So we're very close to being able to finish up entirely the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay, so we'll continue next time. <laughs>